Good evening, and uh, thank you for attending our um, Armenian Medical Society COVID-19 uh, uh, online seminar. I'm very happy to have one of our own, uh, Dr. James Hagop Tabibian, uh, who will be speaking today. Uh, before I go into his introduction, uh, I'd like to note that uh, this is the uh, 29th webinar that we have we have produced uh, through the uh, Armenian American Medical Society with a significant uh, efforts by Vikan Sepilian, Hasmi Keribarian, and the uh, CME team, as well as all of our speakers. So thank you very, very much. We have issued uh, 48 CME credits and 58 CDE credits. And uh, tonight's webinar is CME only. So we'll, we will have reached 50 CME and um, uh, 58 CDE credits. Uh, just a reminder that um, this cycle of CME uh, videos will end by the end of October, October 31st. So to be able to claim CME for these vi videos, you need to complete the questions online before October 31st, after which they will not be online. Um, so, I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. James H. Tabibian. Uh, Dr. Tabibian is an associate professor in the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and the director of endoscopy for the Department of Medicine at All of You UCLA Medical Center. His clinical and research interests are in advanced and therapeutic endoscopy and training the next generation of technically and culturally competent gastroenterologist. Dr. Tabibian grew up in Central California and completed his undergraduate education at UC Davis. He received his MD degree at UCLA, where from he graduated with Alpha Omega Alpha Honors, which is quite a feat. He completed residency training in the Osler Training Program at Johns Hopkins University. Thereafter, he became the first joint NIH ABIM Subspecialty Research Track Fellow in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. <clears throat> During his gastroenterology training, he also completed a PH3, PhD through Mayo Graduate School, Center for Clinical and Translational Studies, CTSA. Following his training at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Tabibian joined the University of Pennsylvania as an instructor and advanced endoscopy fellow. Upon completion of his year at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Tabibian moved back to UC Davis Medical Center as an assistant professor and director of GI fellow research and family needs ultimately brought him back to Southern California in 2017. Dr. Tabibian is experienced in endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, ERCP, endoscopic ultrasound, mucosal resection, EMR, and luminal stenting, among other advanced procedures. He is highly published in the biomedical literature and con continues to co conduct research at UCLA, and he is the founder of GI Expert Opinion. Um, if you are interested, you should look at his CV because uh, it is quite impressive, and uh, we are all very proud of uh, James, who is really doing an amazing job uh, in his role at UCLA. So uh, Dr. Tabibian will be speaking today about um, colon and other GI cancer screening. And I will remind all of the viewers that after his presentation, uh, we will have a post-presentation quiz with uh, audience participation. So please stick around uh, to the end of his uh, lecture to participate. Thanks, and uh, without further ado, Dr. Tabibian, please activate your slides and, and uh, begin your, your lecture. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Barfudarian. Thank you to the AAMS, and thank you all for uh, joining. Uh, We'll go ahead and get started. Hopefully uh, the internet is cooperating and you can all hear me well. Um, so uh, this is a, 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 my first time actually putting together this slide set. So 
but I thought it's an important one uh, in general and also specifically for the Armenian community and for our uh, healthcare professionals uh, of Armenian background and, and for their patients, Armenian or otherwise. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the objectives uh, of this presentation are to provide a background on colorectal cancer, CRC, and the, and the importance of screening for it, identifying who should be screened when and the existing options for CRC screening, recognizing some potential impediments to and also misconceptions regarding effective CRC screening, elucidating conditions which may require additional non-CRC GI cancer screening or surveillance. And uh, that's about it. So let's get started with uh, some background on CRC and the importance, importance of screening. So CRC is an important public health issue in the United States. It's the number four most common cancer and the number two most common cause of cancer death, accounting for nearly 9% of all cancer related deaths. Um, some statistics are shown here on the table on the right showing the colorectal cancer being the fourth most common cancer and also the second most uh, uh, the, the second most common cause of cancer death in the shown in the last column on the right. It's estimated that nearly four percent of all men and women will be diagnosed with CRC at some point during their lifetime unless things change or improve. There are many risk factors for developing CRC. Some are known, some are not, and similarly some are modifiable whereas others are not. If we look at just those that are known or considered to be known and modifiable, these include a lack of regular physical activity, a diet low in fruit and vegetables, a low fiber and high fat diet, a diet high in processed meats, red meats, and also charred meats or meats cooked at very high temperatures, overweight and obesity, tobacco use and heavy alcohol consumption. Uh, CRC can develop in individuals without any of the above risk factors and without any symptoms along the way, hence the need for screening. CRC is preventable with screening and uh, the term screening itself uh, is familiar, I think, to the audience, but just to uh, recap, it refers to testing of average risk asymptomatic individuals. So those who are at, general, at the same general risk as the general population and are not having symptoms that might be due to uh, a given cancer, such as colorectal cancer. CRCs tend to start as asymptomatic precancerous growths referred to as polyps. And there are many polyp types. So the, the main one that is associated with CRC uh, is the adenomatous polyp. On average, it takes about 10 years for an adenomatous polyp uh, to progress to CRC. And polyps, if they are caught in time via screening uh, during these 10 or so golden years, if you will, uh, can, be, can lead to the prevention of, of cancer formation because they can be removed by various techniques such as colonoscopy. So who should be screened and when and how? Well, as far as who should be screened, uh, we should familiarize ourselves with a few terms. The first one being average risk individuals, which refers to those who, who don't have a high risk family history. And in these folks, in these individuals, most national societies would recommend starting CRC screening at age 50. Recently, I think I should mention the American Cancer Society made a, what's called a qualified recommendation based on simulation data to start CRC screening, actually rewinding the clock five years, so at age 45. The audience might be wondering, well, should anyone be screened earlier than 45 or 50? And the answer is yes. So individuals with a high risk family history, which I'll define in a moment, should be screened starting at age 40, not 45, not 50, or 10 years before the age of CRC, or advanced adenoma diagnosis of the earliest family member, whichever comes first. Uh, I'll, I'll define advanced adenoma as well. 
So high-risk family history refers to there being CRC or an advanced adenoma diagnosed in either two first-degree relatives at any age or one first-degree relative prior to age 60. So for example, a, a uh, a mother or father who had colorectal cancer at the age of 85 would not qualify as high-risk family history. Uh, and, and the term advanced adenoma refers to a polyp that in general is greater than or equal to 10 millimeters in size or a centimeter in size, uh, an adenoma that has tubulovillus or villus histology under the microscope or something called high-grade dysplasia. In other words, it's, it's even closer to becoming cancer. And I should mention or clarify here that an individual could have a family risk or high risk family history without actually having colon cancer in the family. So just having a, a history of advanced adenoma uh, in either two first degree relatives or a first degree relative prior to the age of 60 would suffice to meet that definition. So um, does personal personal history, aside from family history, impact screening age? And the answer to that is also yes. So individuals with certain cancer susceptibility gene mutations, syndromes or other disorders may benefit from earlier CRC screening or surveillance. And these include, but aren't limited to Lynch syndrome, BRCA1 or BRCA1 positivity, inflammatory bowel disease, also known as IBD, ulcerative colitis in particular, or primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC. Uh, patients with any of these should consult, should consult with their primary care provider and or a gastroenterologist, an oncologist, or medical geneticist, if appropriate, if, if, um, in, in any of these uh, cases. And also, from a technical perspective, uh, in individuals with an increased risk of CRC due to a personal or family history, the term surveillance may be used instead of screening, since uh, screening tends to refer to those who are at average risk, whereas surveillance will, uh, tends to refer to those who are already believed to be at a heightened risk. So uh, several options exist for CRC screening, many of which the audience will be familiar with. Uh, but in general, I think the options can be conceptualized into two main categories. The first consists of stool-based screening tests, wherein uh, the, a test or an assay will check for hemoglobin or other microscopic markers in the stool, uh, in other words, the feces, uh, which may indicate cancer development. Um, and there are several different examples of stool-based screening tests, such as guaiac-based fecal occult blood testing, or FOBT, fecal immunochemical tests, or FIT, FIT, and stool DNA test, which the current one on the market is called ColoGuard. The second main category of screening options for CRC are the visual or structural tests. And these examine the structure of the colon and the rectum for abnormalities, which may uh, clue one uh, into the presence of a or a precancer. And the main examples of, of such tests are colonoscopy and CT colonography, uh, also known as virtual colonoscopy, which is a tailored CT scan performed with specialized contrast solution and other techniques. It's not a, not a gar garden variety CT of the abdomen, so to speak. And currently there are the, the first tier CRC screening options for average risk individuals are either FIT or FIT or colonoscopy. Um, and, and so those are really are the primary go-tos for most individuals in, in most settings. So how do you pick between these first two, uh, between these two first tier options? Well, there's several factors to consider that I usually go through in my head with, or with my patients or, or both really. Uh, so the first is personal preference. Uh, some patients would never feel comfortable collecting their stool. They just, they just don't like the idea or maybe they can't for uh, various reasons such as physical disability, maybe blindness, maybe otherwise. Uh, whereas on the other hand, there might be patients that would uh, like to avoid drinking a bowel preparation if at all possible. So they would rather do a fit, uh, FIT, uh, rather than go straight to colonoscopy. <clears throat> and 
then uh, I think PCP recommendations are important as well. So some PCPs or gastroenterologists for that matter may encourage one option over, over the other based on prior experiences, local resources, referral options, and other variables. Another important factor is the healthcare system or the insurance policy. Uh, so some healthcare systems, for example, don't offer colonoscopy as a first tier option. That applies, uh, for instance, to uh, Los Angeles County, uh, LADHS. Uh, the, the primary uh, test in LADHS is FIT, not colonoscopy. Uh, and another important factor is personal history, uh, which might render one of the first tier options better or worse than the other. So for instance, patients with multiple prior abdominal or pelvic surgeries may be better served by avoiding colonoscopy and sticking to uh, FIT if possible. Of course, if the FIT results positive, then uh, a um, colonoscopy would be uh, needed. So fortunately though, both first tier options, colonoscopy and FIT, our first tier for a reason. They're, they're both excellent choices. Nevertheless, some personalized decision-making on a patient-by-patient -patient basis may be worthwhile. So should anyone who's above the age of 45 or 50 not be screened for colon cancer for CRC? And the answer is yes. So for those with an estimated life expectancy less than 10 years due to uh, existing illness or comorbidities, uh, CRC screening is generally not recommended. And the reason is because of an unfavorable risk to benefit uh, profile. For those who are above the age of 75 years, um, the decision to start or continue CRC screening should be based on overall health, as well as prior CRC screening history and also patient preferences. So for example, Let's say you have a 76 year old with well-controlled dyslipidemia and no prior CRC screening who wants to undergo CRC screening. In, that, in such an instance, it would be reasonable to recommend CRC screening um, to, this, to this patient, um, unless there's some other reason why not to. So the age of 76 itself should not be a disqualifying factor. Moving on to the impediments to effective CRC screening, there are a number of things that could impede screening. So before the screening even takes place, I think there are two main categories that I think of. One is patient reluctance. So for instance, the patient may feel or a patient may feel uncomfortable or feel that the topic is embarrassing, or they just like to avoid medical checkups or medical tests, or they're, they're not aware of the risk factors for colon cancer or think that the risks of screening are too great for, for um, uh, And my least favorite perhaps here is uh, no symptoms, no problem. And, and that's not true. That, that defeats the, the very nature of screening. Uh, another impediment could be from the PCP side or the referring provider side. And uh, some PCPs may not recommend or bring up the subject because they believe, for example, that the patient is too old or would simply be unwilling to consider uh, CRC screening. During a screening test, uh, there are also impediments. So for example, there might be confounding or mitigating circumstances. Hemorrhoids, for instance, that are acting up while collecting specimen for a fit uh, could result in a false positive, meaning a patient would be referred to a colonoscopy somewhat unnecessarily, so to speak. Uh, another example would be uh, in a patient who is who's undergoing colonoscopy for screening rather than fit, who has a poor bowel preparation uh, for whatever reason, such as they didn't drink the solution in its entirety. Uh, so this, this patient theoretically during their colonoscopy would not have very good visualization of their uh, colon and thus um, to, in, to, to some degree the, the test will be in vain and may need to be repeated. After screening, uh, this is an area of uh, vulnerability or liability even perhaps, uh, the follow-up may not be appropriate or may be delayed. So for example, a patient in whom a fit was checked and was positive, but diagnostic colonoscopy didn't occur in a reasonable time frame, say in six months, um, and instead happened two years later, well, a 
lot can change in two years. And, um, and so it's important that once you have a positive fit um, to, to refer to a gastroenterologist fairly uh, expeditiously. Another example would be repeating uh, that for, uh, a repeat colonoscopy was supposed to occur, let's say in one year, but either the patient didn't know or didn't understand or wasn't adequately uh, notified and thus it doesn't get done for years down the road. Um, so that, that would be an unfortunate scenario that could defeat the, 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 the purpose of screening. And that being said, just come back in X number of years, three years, five years, or some other time frame, is really not a thing. It's not really valid. So there should be specific rationale as to when and why to return for repeat colonoscopy, for instance. And in fact, this is actually a, an evolving topic. And this uh, diagram here shows what should be the recommended time frame to repeat a colonoscopy based on various different findings during a colonoscopy. And I won't go into this in detail, but just know that different scenarios have different recommendations for when to return for colonoscopy. And if all looks well, there's no adenomatous polyps, uh, then a colonoscopy generally be repeated in 10 years. That's the longest time frame that one can have between screening exams with colonoscopy. So I will just want to mention a few words on screening for non-colorectal cancer GI cancers. So as the audience knows, the GI system is comprised of numerous organs, any of which could theoretically develop cancer. And while the colon is the only GI organ for which cancer screening is widely recommended uh, for the US population uh, and others, additional GI cancer screening is also recommended for select patients and in select scenarios. So uh, I think in, in uh, brief, I might say that if an individual has a family history of a GI cancer or even multiple non-GI cancers, uh, which could indicate a cancer syndrome, for instance, that person may be a candidate for additional GI cancer screening. Uh, so this is a scenario that should be discussed with one's PCP and referral to a subspecialist, whether it's gastroenterologist or medical geneticist, for example, should be considered. Um, as far as which additional organs to screen and in whom, uh, the list is complex. Uh, it is evolving, but generally speaking, I think uh, one should consider screening in the following scenarios, which are not an exhaustive list. So uh, esophag esophagus cancer by upper endoscopy, uh, screening for that cancer should be considered in individuals with longstanding gastroesophageal reflux disease symptoms. That's defined as greater than five years, plus one or more of the following risk factors for esophageal cancer male sex, obesity, central adiposity or central obesity or truncal obesity or smoking. Also patients with known Barrett's esophagus, say from a prior upper endoscopy, should also be uh, considered for screening or surveillance really, would be the better term here. Uh, the other organ uh, for which to, to screen or surveil is liver cancer or liver and that should be performed in certain individuals with chronic liver disease, such as chronic hepatitis C with cirrhosis or in hepatitis B, to mention just a few. So I, I do wanna mention a quick word on diagnostic testing, even though this, this presentation is uh, focused on, um, on screening and surveillance. So for patients who have related symptoms, testing is no longer technically considered screening, but rather diagnostic. This distinction uh, might be semantic to some degree, but really it does impact billing, urgency, and other factors. And so in these folks who have symptoms, uh, a comprehensive workup really is necessary. So uh, in general, and this doesn't apply only to, to GI disorders, but I, I would tend to say that labs are a good starting point, but generally are not sufficient. Let's say for the patient with rectal bleeding or abdominal pain, uh, it, such as computed tomography, CT scan, is useful, but it may not be adequately sensitive, especially breast enhanced scan. A and uh, by extension, a negative CT scan doesn't mean there's not a problem. So while it does confer some reassurance, it's not really a perfect test. And that's why endoscopy exists, for instance. But at the same time, endoscopy, whether it's upper endoscopy or, or lower colonoscopy, uh, 
provides an excellent luminal view or mucosal view, but it can't visualize extrinsic structures or organs. So it can't really visualize the pancreas, the spleen, the liver, or the mesentery. So a negative upper or lower endoscopy doesn't uh, confirm that there's nothing wrong. There, there are other avenues to pursue, such as imaging. And lastly, not all abdominal such as pain are GI in origin. So I think it's important to realize that um, the abdomen is occupied by other uh, specialties, if you will, or organ systems, uh, whether it's gynecological, urological, nephrologic, or uh, other. So uh, in summary, uh, colorectal cancer, CRC is common. One in 25 adults in the US will have it at some point in their life. And it's lethal, but it can be prevented or at least detected early enough to be cured by screening. If uh, an individual is above the age of 45 uh, and certainly 50 years, uh, that person should have a discussion with their PCP or gastroenterologist regarding colorectal cancer screening. The vast majority of individuals in the US above the age of 45 or 45 or greater are candidates for screening and one shouldn't wait for the development of symptoms. High risk individuals, uh, either because of uh, personal or family history should be screened starting at an even younger age. And really rarely is there a sound reason to not undergo screening, at least in the opinion of uh, healthcare professionals um, in, in GI, for instance. There are numerous CRC screening modalities. Uh, colonoscopy is not the only option, but it is one of the two first tier options. Um, and screening shouldn't be thought of as painful or scary. It really doesn't need to be, and, and some horror stories maybe that linger around are really not the, the norm. Patients as well as providers can take specific steps to improve the success of screening and decrease the risk of CRC. And uh, lastly, I think here, some patients may be candidates for additional GI cancer screening based on personal risk factors and family history. So that is um, all the slides that I have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tabibian. Very nice lecture. Um, did you have the slides for the questions? Yes. That yeah. we can poll the audience. Yeah. Sure. Should we keep going? Yeah. Let's keep going, and then we can ask, and then we can open up for Q and A. All right. So, um, all right, so um, I guess this will be CME question one. Uh, should I read it out loud or? Hey, why don't you go ahead and read it and then we'll give the attendees some time to, to uh, put their answer in the chat. Just right. the, the letter answer. Okay. Uh, so you see a 38 year old patient in follow-up who states that his 51-year-old sister recently underwent colonoscopy and was found to have an advanced adenoma, a 1.5 centimeter adenomatous rectal polyp. What do you recommend? So option A is wait at least until age 45 to start CRC screening. Option B is colonoscopy upon turning 50. C is evaluate modifiable CRC risk factors and start CRC screening at age 41. And D is obtain a CT scan now. It looks like we have one taker for C. And another for C. Oh, we have our we have our co-host paying That's attention. Right. Coming in with the trifecta of C's. There you go. And he is sitting by the C, answering C. The irony is wonderful. It's quite good. So yeah, uh, C is the correct answer. Um, it looks like everyone is uh, in accord, at least everyone who responded. 
And uh, so uh, it is the right answer, right? And and maybe I'll mention a few words as to why the other yeah, other are not. Yeah. So I think waiting until age forty-five to start um, would go against the guideline to start ten years prior to the earliest family member. So here we have fifty-one minus ten equals 41. So 45 would be a late start for this individual. Colonoscopy upon turning 50, uh, similar issue. That would be too late. And D, obtain a CT scan now. Well, this individual may ultimately need a CT scan, but that's not uh, the appropriate test at this juncture based only on this information. All right. Looks like we're uh, we're doing well for question one. Let's let's see what else you got in store for us. Okay. And my apologies again for the video malfunctioning. Um, oops. But we're hanging in there. So this is question. You're seeing a 49 year old man for a routine checkup. He inquires about CRC screening and states he recently started seeing blood in stool. Which of the following is the most appropriate recommendation? So uh, we have A is start Miralax and come back when turning when turns 50 for occult blood testing, such as with FIT. B is recommend colonoscopy. At this time, diagnostic colonoscopy. C is check an abdominal X blood ulcers. And D is refer to hematology to assess for a bleeding disorder. like we're getting good engagement from our audience I, I, to be yeah. concordant, let's let's see if they're right so i think this audience is either far too well informed or listened very carefully or my questions are too easy um but the answers that are have been uh provided by the audience are all correct so they're all b um and again i'll just go over the wrong answers uh, so start Miralax and come back when turns 50 for occult blood testing. Um, part of that might be right. So if the patient also said, oh yeah, well, I only see blood in my stool when I, when I feel very constipated and I have to strain, then maybe that person should be started on a, on a stool softener such as Miralax. However, the patient is already exhibiting some uh, worrisome symptoms and thus uh, waiting until age 50, I, I think runs the risk of losing precious time. And moreover, if the patient is already seeing gross blood in the stool, checking for occult blood um, is probably not advisable. Um, B is the correct answer. So recommend colonoscopy. And note, at this point, it would be diagnostic. This is not a screening because there are already symptoms uh, of potentially colon cancer. C is not correct. Uh, an x-ray is a poor study to look for ulcers, unless the question that's being asked is, is there a perforation of an ulcer and is there free air in the abdomen? Um, really endoscopy is the best way to look for, for ulcers uh, depending on where we're talking, but in the GI tract endoscopy would be the best uh, modality. And refer to hematology to assess for a bleeding disorder. Uh, rectal bleeding itself generally is not due to a bleeding uh, disorder or seeing blood in stool, but if there were other uh, features such as gums bleeding, frequent nosebleeds and so forth, then I think maybe the hematology referral uh, would make sense. So moving on, here is question three. Uh, you refer your patient to a gastroenterologist for diagnostic colonoscopy after a positive fit. He is found to have four adenomatous polyps during colonoscopy. He's a smoker and relatively sedentary. Which of the following should you advise? A is increasing fiber and water intake. B is colonoscopy in five years to make sure everything is okay. C is repeat fit next year, especially if the patient notes any blood in stool. And D is confirming with gastroenterologists when repeat colonoscopy should be performed and recommending tobacco cessation and increasing activity in the interim. All 
All right, we have a couple of takers, three takers for D. We have one from for B. Garni likes uh, Dr. Barkodarian likes fiber and water take water intake increases. I'm trying to go against the grain so that it's not like we're all getting it right. <laughs> and no pun intended with the grain, considering grain fiber is uh, is uh, one important source. So here we have a little bit of um, variation in the audience responses. I think this is a tough question potentially, but not necessarily intended to be. Um, so <clears throat> the, the correct answer here is what I think the majority indicated, that's D as in David. Um, yeah. So A is probably not right because um, we don't know that the patient is on a low fiber diet, adequate fiber intake. And so empirically recommending fiber and more water intake might just lead this person to be gassier and need to use the restroom more often than necessary without any other really uh, discernible benefit. A colonoscopy in five years to make sure everything is okay. That's kind of a, you know, that be a, a risk uh, based approach that sounds like it's more of a maybe an empiric uh, approach um, so uh, be, and, and just having four adenomatous polyps alone doesn't tell us enough about uh, when this patient should return uh, so we really need more information uh, C repeat fit next year especially if patient notes any blood well there's no reason to repeat a fit next year this patient has already kind of ascribed to colonoscopy, diagnostic colonoscopy, um, and has now found to be polyps. So returning to fit in one year uh, would not be correct. And if there's blood noted in the stool, even more reason to not check a test for occult blood because you're already seeing it or the patient is seeing it with, with the bare eyes. Uh, D is the correct answer um, for, uh, and it's kind of a compound question. Um, which perhaps made it more challenging. So we do want more information from the gastroenterologist as far as when to repeat the colonoscopy. It would depend on what type of adenomatous polyps these were histologically, how big they were, the gastroenterologist, he or she removed them, uh, and how uh, adequate the bowel prep was. Because if they found four polyps, but the prep wasn't good, then there's a chance that there's actually another four still in there in which case the gastroenterologist might say, you know, this patient should come back in six, within six months with a better bowel prep to really make sure we get an adequate look at, at the uh, meantime, I think also discussing with the patient about tobacco sensation and increasing aerobic activity uh, is, is, is appropriate. Well, that was a that was a good session, uh, Hagop. Um, that last question was tougher, but I'm glad that uh, the majority of our our engaged audience uh, got it right. So that means that um, they were paying attention to you, and um, and uh, certainly, hopefully, we learned something here. Um, I encourage the audience to ask any questions for Dr. Tabibian. Um, now is a good opportunity to do so. But um, I'll kick it off. Um, with one, with a couple of questions, actually. So um, it, was, it was great to see all these different screening options. And you mentioned some of the opportunities where one may be favored over another. For example, if a patient had prior surgery or can't do a good bowel prep, that may uh, favor uh, a stool type test. But can you tell us, Hagop, um, what test is, is um, is considered the best or the gold standard or the most sensitive for uh, detecting um, CRCs in a particular patient population? So I think both colonoscopy as well as fecal immunochemical tests or FIT are considered the gold standard, but they are very different tests. One is essentially non-invasive um, and if the result comes out favorable, if it's a negative test, you need to repeat it in a year. Um, if it's positive, then a case is made to proceed with a diagnostic colonoscopy. 
the colonoscopy is again also a gold standard. It's the, the second of the two first tier options, uh, but it's a very different beast. Uh, it requires a bowel prep. It uh, is invasive and uh, it does have a very low risk of serious complications, uh, very, very low risk, and, but it also has a miss rate. So people shouldn't think they had a colonoscopy, there is a 0% chance of anything being missed. Whereas if they do the stool test, there's a chance that something could have been missed. Uh, in fact, depending on who the colonoscopist is and how well the bowel has been prepared, how much time is spent in the colon and so forth, in some ways, the fecal immunochemical test, the FIT, is more sensitive. Uh, so I, I really think that of those two options, uh, which one to proceed in, in a given patient should depend on some of the variables we talked about in the presentation as far as one's own preferences, uh, how soon is a colonoscopy gonna, gonna, going to be available, what does their health uh, care system uh, recommend as the first tier, and do they have any personal factors that might uh, render one test uh, better than the other or worse than the other. So really, I, I think if, if it were my mother or my, my cousin or my father, I wouldn't say, oh, colonoscopy is the way to go because I'm a gastroenterologist and that's what I believe. No, I actually think both first tier uh, tests are very, very appropriate. And, uh, and um, in some ways one might say, well, I'd rather go the fit test because if that's positive, then I know that I really most likely needed the colonoscopy. Um, so it, some of it is a philosophical uh, rather than a scientific uh, matter. Well, that's very helpful. Well, we have some questions from the audience. Um, I think an important question, and um, you know, I think this comes up with any type of cancer discussion. Uh, one question is, uh, why is smoking a risk factor for colon cancer? I mean, it's it's not really by the lungs or anything. How, how is smoking affecting colon cancer? So that's a great question. I don't think that the mechanisms are well uh, understood, but do realize that when someone smokes tobacco or chews tobacco for that matter, uh, there are components which enter the bloodstream, even though uh, you're not eating them, but they are being absorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, and, and that's what produces some of the euphoric or dysphoric effects of, of tobacco. Um, so uh, some of these might also be, some of this might also be an association. Um, so maybe people who smoke also have other bad habits which predispose to colon cancer. Teasing that apart is, is difficult. Um, and I don't think uh, it, would be, it would be untrue if I said every smoker is going to develop colon cancer. That's certainly not the case but it is a modifiable risk factor and, and it's been shown to be a risk factor. Uh, uh, so um, I think for folks who can cut back or quit, they should. And I don't only say that for their, for their colon health, but really for their health overall, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and, and really you name it. Yeah, I, um, I have to agree. Um, you know, I take care of uh, lots of cancer patients myself, and uh, smoking is is a risk factor for a ton of different types of cancers, uh, unrelated to the lung, and also um, just the a typical smoker will have a harder time in surgery, will have a harder time getting hospitalized. Definitely, that's been shown uh, dealing with COVID and the coronavirus infection. You know, I think just in general, smoking is bad, and we know this as medical professionals. Um, but uh, I think we need to keep pushing our Armenian population patients who sometimes are recalcitrant to this advice uh, to really very seriously quit smoking uh, and, uh, and there's still a, a benefit uh, to do so even after you quit. Um, well, in, in that line, there is a follow-up question sort of uh, related to that uh, by Hovo. Um, he said, great talk, Dr. Tabibian. This is a non-medical question. Um, stubbornness being an Armenian characteristic, any advice on how to talk to Armenians over the age of 50 in our community to have a colonoscopy for cancer screening? And, and um, go ahead, uh, Hago, take it away. Yeah, so, you know, that's a difficult subject. Um, and, you know, stubbornness is probably only one of the many impediments to, to getting screened, uh, or is only one way to, to say it. Um, 
And it's actually the, one of the reasons why I wanted to speak about this, this subject rather than something that's perhaps more subspecialized uh, because it is so pervasive. Um, I think it, you have to break it down to why are people being, or why is an Armenian or someone else being stubborn about not wanting to be screened? So I think if you break it down into its basic components, that might shed some light on how to best address it. So for some, it's, it's, a, it's just an extra hassle. I'm going to be in pain. They're going to be shoving this thing up here and up there. Some of those misconceptions need to be uh, dispelled that, hey, look, there's actually multiple ways to screen. None of them are necessarily. Um, and um, you can prevent cancer before it even happens. So uh, this is, um, you know, why not do it? Um, there, there are some people who you'll never be able to potentially convince, but others, I think if you just say, look, you know, put aside all the, the old wives tales or the, the misconceptions or the horror stories, it's really not that bad. It really can be quite quick. And if you're going to the doctor anyway for your blood pressure or your glaucoma or your toenail infection or your frequent headaches, mention this as well. And it might be as simple as just su submitting a stool sample. Um, and if it's negative, great, you have that peace of mind. And if it's positive, well, there's a clear kind of next step as to, to what to do uh, to get to the bottom of it before it becomes a, a really uh, potentially a big problem. Yeah, well said, uh, Dr. Tabibian. Uh, one of our uh, board members is on the line and she, uh, she has a question. Dr. Karchikian has a question about, I think a patient of hers, which, which actually is more of a broader question, but the patient, uh, had a colonoscopy at the age of 60, had a report of three normal polyps and a benign sigmoid, but he had a repeat colonoscopy because he remained symptomatically and, and um, was found to have stage three colon sequel cancer. How, how often do you see this type of scenario um, where, where the screening may have, have failed in, in a situation like this? Yeah, so that's obviously a very unfortunate situation as the patient seemingly did their part, had the screening colonoscopy. Um, so this, without knowing any other specifics about the patient, what this probably <clears throat> is a case of is there was a precancerous lesion perhaps in the cecum at the time of the first colonoscopy, which uh, was not seen. And so again, colonoscopy is not 100% perfect. And the cecum is actually a, a capacious area. It's, it's relatively, um, uh, has a large capacity. Uh, and in part because of that, it can hide lesions. So uh, one of our quality metrics, in fact, for colonoscopy is to show, photo document the cecum and the appendiceal orifice. So if I don't see that on a colonoscopy report, uh, and granted, I, I'm, I'm a gastroenterologist, and so maybe my level of scrutiny is, is higher than maybe a general practitioner or perhaps a general surgeon or a radiologist. Um, I, I do not consider that uh, a complete exam. And, and so uh, you, you really need to make sure that the quality metrics are there. The appendiceal orifice was visualized. The bowel prep was good or was adequate, uh, because if it's a poor bowel prep, but, or inadequate, but you happen to find three polyps and you remove them, there's still the problem of the bowel prep was not adequate. So you need to go back in in an expedited time frame. It may not be next week, but it shouldn't be in three years or even a year. Um, so that is just one scenario, one possible explanation for this scenario, uh, which is not a common scenario. But colonoscopy can miss a single digit percentage lesions. So maybe 2%, 3%, 4%. And it depends too on the, uh, the endoscopist. So not all endoscopists uh, have the same exact adenoma detection rate. Uh, that is a problem in the field and uh, artificial intelligence is trying to uh, address that as our other uh, interventions. But um, I, I think that is just, it's a, it's a tough miss. It's, it's very unfortunate. Yeah, that, that is challenging uh, to say the least. Um, we have a question from uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, is there toxicity to the bowel prep solution for colonoscopies? 
especially if it is used repeatedly? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so most bowel preps, although not 100%, are um, either, um, are, are largely composed of uh, non-absorbed compounds uh, or molecules such as polyethylene uh, glycol. Uh, it, it is not absorbed by the body. So the short answer is no. Um, there are preps, in fact, many of them have some additives as well, but they're usually electrolytes that help to con uh, maintain uh, homeostasis with the large fluid shifts associated with bowel preparation. So to my knowledge, uh, there have not been any cases of uh, hepatotoxicity or liver injury associated with uh, a bowel prep. But then again, I, I don't know how rigorously frequent bowel preps uh, has been studied. So depending on what we mean by frequent, you know, could you take it every six months? Um, sure, yeah, you could. And we have patients who have colonoscopies every six to 12 months because of certain risk factors. But could you take it every other day uh, and, that, and, and not cause harm to your body, whether it's the liver or otherwise? Well, that, that would seem excessively frequent. And I, I can't imagine an indication to, to do that. Uh, so again, short answer is probably not, but I, I suppose uh, if it's used uh, improperly, uh, that, that is a possibility. Oh, thanks, Agop. Agop, I have a question that um, is not really relevant to this lecture, but it piqued my curiosity. I was reading your, um, your CV and your, your bio, and it says that one of your research interests is disparities and ethno-racial variations in digestive diseases. And I see that actually may correlate with your PhD as well, if I'm not mistaken. Can yeah, you expand yeah. on that a bit? Tell us what that's about and what, what you figured out so far. Yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, it's an interesting question. Let me think how to best answer that. Uh, I would say, I, I think we've appreciated not only in gastroenterology, but in almost every other uh, field of uh, healthcare or uh, medicine that different diseases can present in different ways in different populations and might have uh, phenotypic variations. Um, and so I, I really am not a proponent uh, almost by any means of uh, a one size fits all approach. And, and so I think we really need to tailor our thinking and our interventions to the specific patient or the specific patient population, whether it's our approach to can GI cancer screening, or it's our approach to how to best treat a headache uh, or a migraine. Uh, so I, I think being mindful or cognizant of those variations between ethno-racial groups uh, is important. And uh, it helps us to uh, not only pick up on, uh, on disease diagnostically, manage it better. So um, uh, for example, uh, just, just one example, gastric cancer is more common in Latinos. So if we take an approach of don't screen for gastric cancer in the U.S. because that's what's recommended, well, that's okay. Um, but if you have a patient who is Latino or has other risk factors for gastric cancer, let's say, and they present to you with symptoms uh, or signs that are compatible with gastric cancer, such as a thickened stomach on a CAT scan, I wouldn't be quick to dismiss that. In fact, I would work it up thoroughly to make sure that we're not missing something. Um, so uh, again, trying to tailor, customize the medicine to the patient uh, in hand. Um, that's just kind of one, one aspect of that. That's fantastic. I think that's, that's great, uh, great to hear and I'm um, glad you're you're doing such great work in your lab and, and uh, with the work of uh, the collaborators that you have. Uh, we did have one other question, going back to your topic. Um, Dr. Yeretsen had a question regarding um, sensitivity between FIT or ADN. Which one is more sensitive, FIT or ADN? And by ADN, we're, we're referring to uh, DNA testing? I, I'm not sure. I wonder if that's what he meant. <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. I was hoping you would know, but maybe it's fit or DNA. Uh, we'll go with, with that. So um, they are both very, very sensitive. Uh, I think that's what the question was. Was it about sensitivity? Yes. That's correct. Uh, 
They're both sensitive, and I would say overall uh, there are no uh, so cologuard, yeah. So DNA uh, testing. Um, I would say that uh, there are no clinically significant differences in the sensitivity. What a what DNA testing or cologuard offers that fit doesn't. Uh, is that it's in some ways a pan aerodigestive screening test. So that's good and bad. Uh, it's bad because if you have a positive cologuard result uh, and you a colonoscopy is performed and it's negative, you're left wondering, well, now is there something more proximal to the colon that is running into precancerous or cancerous changes, whether it's from the pancreas or the pancreatic duct, the bile duct, the stomach, the small bowel, the esophagus. And so in many institutions, uh, a negative colonoscopy after a, a positive cologuard or stool DNA test is not adequate. You then go on to an upper endoscopy or to a CAT scan or some other algor algorithmic approach um, because of the nature of the cologuard. Whereas a fit, really is, is supposed to be more specific to blood loss from the colon. Uh, so I, I kind of deviated a bit from the, the question, but I think uh, it, it's an important question and a, and a complex one. Uh, I don't think I would choose one or the other on, um, on uh, sensitivity basis uh, alone, since they're both very, very sensitive. Excellent, thanks. I think, um... One of our co-hosts, Dr. Sepilian, has a question for you as well. Dr. Sepilian? Yeah, thank you, Garni, and, and Dr. Talibian, thank you very much for a uh, you know, very informative and very important uh, lecture. Um, I'd like to ask for you to perhaps touch upon the role of genetics in terms of gastrointestinal cancers, including colon. With the you know rapid evolution of the various uh, genetic testing modalities that are measuring uh, predisposition to various cancers, I wonder if you can um, touch upon you know in addition to colon cancer maybe some of the other gastrointestinal uh, um, cancers. I know this could be a topic in and itself, but you know if you can give a quick overview and thank you. Thank you. Um, so very an intriguing and, and very progressive uh, question, I, I, I will say. Um, I think there, there's a number of ways to answer this question. So at some point in our lifetimes, I think it's quite possible that people will undergo a whole genome sequencing or some other high throughput uh, test to determine if they have risk factors for brain cancer, for esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, and that might inform screening or surveillance. Maybe we won't get to that, to that point because of uh, privacy concerns or, or paranoia or costs or what have you, but um, it, it's, it is possible. Um, certainly genetics play into the risk of all of these cancers uh, by and large. Uh, how much they play a risk, um, we don't know for sure for every cancer. And sometimes the environmental risk um, might play a bigger role or maybe might synergize with a genetic predisposition. So if, let's say you have the genetic predisposition and on top you have a poor diet and you smoke, you may develop a cancer X, let's say the colon, as opposed to if you had that predisposition, but you did not add the second hit from the tobacco and the poor diet, you may actually get through your lifespan without ever developing that cancer. Um, so I think genetics is important. Um, and I think if you know of abnormal, uh, uh, of a family history in this regard that might uh, raise an eyebrow, it should be brought up to the PCP because there are, for example, syndromes where uh, uh, that affect, let's say the uterus as well as other organs, as well as the GI tract. So just because someone has uterine cancer but not colon cancer in their family doesn't mean they may not be at higher risk of a colon or GI cancer. And I think I tried to touch upon that, but it's, it's really, a, like you said, a, a, an area in and of itself. And I didn't want to detract from the colon cancer screening topic, but um, I think we should pay attention to our genes. And if they are, con are, are telling us that we may be at higher risk of a certain illness, cancer or otherwise, 
we should you know, take heed of that and be, be cognizant moving forward. Communicate that with your PCP so that they know to, to be on the lookout with you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Well, uh, Dr. Tabibi and I, I'd like to thank you very, very much for um, your expertise and your very clear um, portrayal of, of this important topic on uh, colon cancer screening. Um, I think you, there's a question uh, in the chat, but this is a personal question. So maybe you can answer that after the fact. Um, but uh, I'd like to conclude this session um, uh, and thank all of our attendees for um, participating uh, in the question and answer session and also remind people uh, that are interested in CME credits to go to the website and uh, fill out the form online and uh, you will receive your credit. Uh, again, Dr. Tabi Ben, thank you so much. And um, there will be a number of more uh, lectures uh, down the, the next few weeks. So I uh, encourage everyone to participate and uh, we will see you then. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Vikan and Haspik for, for co-hosting. And, and of course, thank you, Dr. Tabi Bian. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.